Welcome to another episode of Emancipated Human. I have my friend Quinn Aker with me today. He's going to tell us uh, a few good stories um, of his awesome interaction with lovely government. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his sustainable living. I think that we ha what he has to say is pretty important, pretty um, amazing, and uh, it's really... Um, powerful so with that I'm gonna let him introduce himself and so Quinn tell us a little bit about yourself well I am you know a man just like pretty much every other man I eat food I drink water I breathe air uh, I have a family uh, and really in truth all humans are much more similar than they are dissimilar we have much more in common than you know we have as a difference uh, so to me that's really important to focus on that you know to really remember that you know really we all want the same thing um, except for maybe a few you know really perverted you know sociopathic uh, you know power hungry you know folk out there but generally speaking uh, even even those people are still eating food and breathing air and you know having a family of some kind mm -hmm. so really we're all we're all very similar and to me that's really important with that being said i am about as interesting and about as different and unique as you're going to find a man especially in this in this metroplex in this uh, dfw area uh, when i was 17 years old i was depressed i was sick um, part of why i was so miserable is because i was looking out at the world and i was like i mean i have to live in this world for 80 more years like this is like this is like hell this is hell on earth. I didn't see anything I agreed with. I didn't agree with the healthcare system. I didn't agree with the agricultural system. I didn't agree with the way people spent their lives working every freaking day, sitting in traffic, you know, putting on uniforms, uh, you know, doing things only because they're getting a piece of paper. Um, I wasn't aware of the fiat currency system and the central banking, you know, uh, you know, credit system at that point in time. But I still knew that the whole, you know, the whole money thing was just ridiculous. Um, you know, I looked at families, and you know, families didn't, from my perspective, really love each other, really care about each other, really support each other, really spend time with each other. You know, they were always fighting and always lying and manipulating. I just, I just looked at the world and it was like, man, I don't, I don't want any of these people's lives. Even the, even the stars, you know, the movie stars and things like that, I didn't want their life either because it was like, you know, they've got all this power, all this fame, all this fortune. What are they doing with it? They're selling another record they're selling another another movie and that's it uh, that's there's nothing more than that there's no real purpose there's no you know so I was just I was really miserable man uh, I was sick uh, you know weak you know my life you know pretty much sucked and I, I really wanted to commit suicide I really wanted my life to end I wished I wasn't alive so that I didn't have to suffer uh, obviously, I, I didn't wind up uh, taking my life, committing suicide, you know, whatever you want to call that. Is it because I'm brave or is it because I'm scared? You know, that's, you know, debatable. Uh, but what I did wind up doing is I made a choice. And this is the real significant. This was the first, besides being born, this was the first most pivotal and profound moment of my life. And the choice that I made was to find and or create something that I'd never seen before. A whole way of life, not just a job, you know, not just just some compartmentalized facet, but a whole new paradigm, a whole new world. Um, so when I made that choice, what immediately was now the question is, well, how do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I had a relatively alternative, uh, you know, upbringing, lifestyle. I was, you know, relatively intelligent, uh, you know, free thinking individual, uh, but, the only thing I really knew is that everything I'd ever seen on TV, read in the books, uh, you know, next door, at the church, at the, at the mall, anything I'd ever seen definitely wasn't it. Mm -hmm. um, so what was it? Um, and what came to, to be clear to me was that I had to, I had to walk a spiritual path. I had to look sort of beyond this earth. I had to look beyond some, beyond, be, something beyond me. I had to look to something even beyond humanity beyond this earth so to me that was spirituality I already knew that religion was a, a tool to control people um, so I wasn't interested in religion uh, but I was interested in spirituality sort of the nature of existence that timeless question is what is our purpose what is the meaning of life um, that, so that, that sort of thing so what I wound up doing is truly dedicating my life to spirituality and when I did that I was actually in high school 
and I dropped out of high school because it was obvious to me that that was not the answer, right? So I dropped out of high school my senior year. Um, I dedicated my entire life to spirituality. I gave up all sexual energy. I didn't think about sex. I didn't masturbate. I didn't have a girlfriend. No porno. No nothing. No high thoughts school. in high school. 17 year old. Like so much. I mean. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and before I did that, we're talking about like thinking about sex and thinking about girls all the freaking time. Yeah. Right. So it was this was it was just this really huge thing. And what I what I learned how to do, which was really powerful, is I actually learned how to focus my attention consciously. And I began to consciously focus all of my attention every single day from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep on spirituality. And what that means is I didn't have you know, I didn't have friends, I didn't have girlfriends, didn't think about sex, um, you know, didn't have a job, didn't go to high school. My time was all freed up. So all I did was read, write, and meditate. And uh, as soon as I started doing that, my life began to get significantly better. And I began to come across things and find things that I had never seen or heard of before. And that really is the beginning of where I am now, you know, 14 years ago. Um, That's pretty awesome. And even the way you started um, answering the question sounded pretty zen to me. I eat, I drink water, I go to sleep, I have a family. That was pretty zen to me. I, I do have a background on that too. So, uh, you know, I, I was able to relate to a lot of that. So from there, 14 years later, we're here. And this is, what's the size of this property? This is a 3.5, 3.7 acre. And we're in the of middle land. of the... DFW Metro. We are right in the middle of DFW, 20 minutes from downtown Fort Worth, 30 minutes from downtown Dallas, um, you know, right in Arlington, you know, which is really actually one of the worst cities uh, possible to do this uh, whole sustainable living thing. I don't know if you're aware, but Arlington is actually one of the few cities that has openly embraced Agenda 21. Yes. Um, which, you know, is a pretty big statement in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously. Uh, if you don't know what Agenda 21 is, I'm going to post a link down below for you to uh, look that up real quick. Yeah, it's worthwhile information, worthwhile research, just to see a little bit more of the of the background, the foundation for what's really happening. Because, see, again, this is one of the huge problems with almost all of life, especially in this country, is that, you know, we're being told stories. We're being shown certain bits of information to make us think certain things. Yeah. But really, underneath, there's a, a much different quite potentially the exact opposite yes. uh, current that is actually that is actually flowing that's actually moving you know the economics and the laws and you know all the stuff that's actually influencing our life so the more aware we are the the more capable we are of actually addressing what's really going on in a, in a responsible manner and I think this also goes back to focusing because the secret of life is what you focus on exactly and focus is not just like okay, I'm going to do this right now, but like really focusing, verting all your like energy into one activity. And that, that in itself is meditation. Yeah. So from there, when you start focusing to here, like w when did you start this? Well, um, you know, like I said, when I you know, was 17, I devoted my life to spirituality. So, you know, in a way, that's really where this begun. And this is just more of a manifestation, uh, you know, a more uh, sort of masterful example mm -hmm. um, of that path that I've been on. Basically, I spent four years of my life sort of on a pilgrimage, um, didn't own stuff, didn't have a job, you know, didn't have friends, didn't have girlfriends. Um, really, my whole life's purpose was to uh, find find the truth of the universe yeah. to find the truth of God to you know find the purpose of life to learn the secrets of how life actually works and what's really happening and really what I found out is that ultimately it's really just all within inside of myself and you know I spent a good you know year like reading and that's what I did it's just I went through book after book after book after book after book and I found stuff that was important it um, unlocked certain facets of myself um, but ultimately what I found out is that really it's all just my own relationship with myself. Yes. Um, so what I like to tell people is that, you know, the government is not the problem. You know, the mega corporations are not the problem. Uh, guns are not the problem. Sex, drugs, alcohol, they're not the problem. 
None of these things are the problem. The problem is, is what is our relationship with yes. these things? You know, guns didn't come to this earth on a spaceship and then, you know, start, you know, sailing and running around, <laughs> the, running around the world, you know, like coming up to people and being like, I'm going to shoot you because I'm a gun yeah. unless you do what I say. Nope. Humans created guns and humans are using guns to destroy things, uh, to kill people, to manipulate. Or, you know, maybe, I mean, I have mine but it's like for safety purposes you know right. i mean self-defense not necessarily out of wanting to kill well you that may be true but you're one of you know 0.1 percent you think so oh yeah for sure if you look at the amount of ammo that's used on this earth but I how mean, much of that ammo is used for self-defense because i'll tell you a fact the the united states military budget has the largest defense um, budget of any country in the entire world and how much of that is used for defense no it should be the department of occupation yeah it's it's the department of global patrol yeah Depar you know the de department of global uh, tyranny that's i mean that'd be much more accurate it's not homeland security it's just uh, empowering the empire continuing that scavenger in you know, uh, dysfunctional energy that they have. But it, then again, it goes back to the self, that, you know, hurt people hurt people. So like after going, you know, several times on like ayahuasca trips in San Pedro, like these guys are just big bullies that have been hurt. Right. Would you not see it kind of like that? I totally agree. And that's one of the reasons why I have no judgment. Um, I judge nobody, even people that do things that I disagree with. Um, I have no judgment on those people, and I still give those people a chance. I still forgive those people. I still give those people an opportunity. I still love those people. Um, again, because I know that everything is just our relationship with ourselves. So, yeah. again, guns aren't the problem. Government's not the problem. Now, with that being said, obviously, basically every single thing the government does, I disagree with. Does that mean that I judge them? No, I don't, I don't judge the individuals. I don't blame the government because I know it's just this huge misunderstanding, really. It's this huge misunderstanding that people have, through their ignorance, through their institutionalization, been caught up in. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, share a living, breathing example of a whole new world, of a whole new paradigm. So when I dedicated my life to the spiritual path, you know, I did a lot of reading. Ultimately, I found out that all the answers to everything are within, which really is just my relationship with myself. Um, and I've been mastering that. I've been cultivating for that for a long period of time. And what I found for myself is that really I couldn't be truly at one with the universe or truly in connection or communion with God or, or with Source Prime when I was around other people. I had to be alone. I had to be in meditation yeah. in order to be clear. Otherwise, I'd get caught up in people's lives. I'd you know, feel insecure or I'd feel jealous or I'd feel uh, you know, inhibited or need someone's approval or you know, some sort of uh, you know, limitation on my self-expression. So I spent four years really mastering myself to where I could get to a point where I could look at anybody in the eyes, uh, standing there naked. Um, I could, you know, be a, be around somebody doing something that I totally disagreed with and not get angry. Um, you know, not ju get judgmental, but but love them regardless. Yeah. Um, so after I mastered that, basically I came out of being alone. I came out of my pilgrimage, and I really haven't spent a day alone since because everywhere I go, you know, people are just. You know, they want to be, they want to ask questions, they want to be involved. Um, everywhere I go, people are, are inspired, they're, uh, they're motivated to, you know, to, to, to be a part of, uh, you know, this, this wave that I'm riding. Yeah, and one of those things is avoiding interactions that are fueling this massive, what would you call it, murderous attempt from government so you're um, instead of going against the government you're focusing towards the possibilities exactly and that's the key and see most people do not understand this uh, especially people in politics um, you know as you know I've got I I got into politics um, you know because I met some you know uh, relatively influential individuals uh, in the libertarian party and you know they basically approached me and they you know said you know you're just a, a perfect example of a libertarian um, we would just love to have you on the team we would love to have you run you know run for something so that we can you know support you and you know work with you and be behind you and you know I was like hey man my whole life is about 
sharing possibility. My whole life is about pushing the envelope. My whole life is about always making life every single day better than it was the day before. Mm -hmm. If I can do that within this uh, movement, I will be more than happy to do that. Um, so I did get involved with that. Um, and one of the first speeches that I gave, um, actually when I was um, unanimously uh, elected as the um, official candidate for House 96 Libertarian uh, State Representative, um, one of the speeches that I gave was somewhere along the lines of, uh, the real power is not in politics. And our real power as individual is not as politicians. Most of us here will not actually be elected to a seat. So hopefully we don't um, allow that to dictate our influence on this world yeah. and on our community. What I really want from everybody here is for us to take this opportunity to get to know each other, to get on board with common purpose, with common mutual beneficial you know, agreements, mm -hmm. uh, to work together, to you know, uh, you know, organize together, to, uh, to use our individual capacities as human beings uh, to communicate and integrate what we know to be true, what we know to be solutions, yeah. and not allow a political seat to dictate whether we speak our mind, whether we organize in our community, whether we, you know, uh, use initiative for change. Yeah. And that was really my speech. And so what I was really saying is, is that we are powerful individuals regardless of a political seat or not. And mm -hmm. we have to awaken to that because the problem with this country right now is that people have given up their sovereign power. Yes. They've totally traded it in and now they are subjects. They are citizens. They are, you know, taxpayers. And they're dependents. They're dependent upon the beast. They're dependent upon the system, which they think is feeding them, but really they're feeding it. Yes. And people have to realize that. People have to wake up to that. So what we have to wake up to as individuals is that we are the power. We are the power and that works on a, a nationwide scale mm -hmm. and it also works on an individual scale. And the way I've proven that on an individual scale is that, you know, I've interacted with this very dysfunctional, broken, uh, slave, you know, subjectivity world for many years and I am not having the experience of this world that they're having, even though we're in the same world. I'm in the freaking city of Arlington, one of the worst cities you could possibly be in to do what I'm doing. And I'm succeeding. I'm thriving. This is the most sustainable eco-village in all of DFW. I haven't paid for food in 12 years. I haven't been to a doctor in 15 years. I haven't been sick in 13 years. Um, you know, I haven't worked out in nine years. I'm, you know, super fit. Um, I don't take any supplements, no vitamins, no herbs, um, you know, no, no nothing. Uh, the reason why I'm so healthy, the reason why my life is so great is because I've got this relationship with myself that is clear, that is conscious, that is confident, that is empowered, that is loving, that is supportive, that is, you know, listening, that is honoring, um, versus denying my truth. I'm yeah. honoring my truth instead of denying my truth. And I've proven this on a bigger scale also with the Garden of Eden, because right now, for example, we've got 20 people that are living here. And the 20 people that are living here all agree that this is the best life they've ever had. They all agree on that. They all agree that out of all the places they could possibly be, this is where they want to be. Um, they all get healthier. Every single person that comes to live here gets healthier than they were when they, when they got here. Um, they learn amazing skills and abilities. Every single day is a new day. The, I've had many people that come here and tell me that in one week of being here, they've learned more uh, than their whole life combined. I've had people that come here and tell me that from one week of being here, they've learned more than they learned in their whole four years of college. Um, you know, I've had people come here and say, this is the only real valuable skills I've actually ever learned. Um, I've had people that come here and tell me, if this is food, I don't know what I've been eating my whole life. I mean, like really profound stuff. Yeah. So it's, it goes beyond even the people that live here. We have an open house every Sunday. We feed 40,000 free meals a year. No funding, no church, no political organization. You know, we're not, uh, 
you know, connected with Walmart and, you know, getting all sorts of, you know, food. We're not a food bank. Like, I'm a man. No subsidies, no for, uh, foreign assistance, no nothing. You are so sustainable. You're able to do that yeah. from the work you do here. Right. My, my, uh, the abundance that I am living in is so profound that I am not just able to acquire enough food, but to prepare it, to serve it, to clean it up. Um, and I do it without any disposables. We use no disposables whatsoever, no paper napkins, no paper plates, no plastic silverware. Um, you know, we cook everything on a, on a wood-burning stove, um, a, a, a wood-burning earthen oven. Um, we've got a well. I mean, just every single step of the way, like this is, I mean, as sustainable as you're going to find in any, in any Metroplex. And at the same time, I mean, you're not without the uh, 21st century essentials like internet or oh, no. cell I mean, you have an iPhone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I think that the paradigm that you're showing, although, you know, you and I were talking at the, at the convention in Austin, you know, like this is your deal. And uh, if other people are able to do other things and just trade with you, you know, you would be able, you, you sell some stuff to other people. So instead of paying your tax dollars to a certain store, you know, you come here, I give you my money, you know, whatever kind of money that would be, you know, silver, um, maybe even dollars sometimes. Um, and then it, this is completely off the records. Nobody knows. Right. You're not funding wars and massive right. killings. So that part is pretty, to me, it's pretty um, seductive. Right. So from there, um, maybe if in a few minutes we can just uh, take a look around to see all the wonderful things that you've created here. Right. So um, before we do that, tell us about the little visit from um, our friends, lovely friends from Arlington Police Department and the SWAT team. Right. So they left with, I mean, well, I, I won't tell the story, you tell the story. Well, it is a pretty long story, uh, and just every single step of the way, it's ridiculous. So the more details I put in there, uh, really, the more ridiculous the whole story becomes. Uh, you know, we've been we've been living here sustainably for you know probably like five years. Um, you know, growing a lot of food, using a well. Um, you know, having multiple people living here. We've been more of an established, you know, sort of community type place for about, you know, three, you know, three and a half years. Uh, but it was only when I started, like, being public with what we were doing that we had this problem. Um, so about, I don't know, it was the one year anniversary on August 2nd for the raid. So around two years ago, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the city of Arlington, you know, we, 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 went, for, we went for years without having any, any interactions with them whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, you know, bam, they're, you know, giving us these citations, uh, you know, for all sorts of stuff, like improperly stacked wood, you know, indoor furniture that's outdoors, you know, vehicles parked on non-paved you know, driveways, um, you know, I mean, just all grass that's too long, all sorts of really ridiculous stuff that's an essential part of the life that we're living. Um, you know, so we get these citations and, you know, we respond to them uh, honorably um, according to due process of law. And basically what we do is we respond and we say, look, um, from, from my perspective, and unless you can prove otherwise, I have the right to uh, my pursuit of happiness. I have the right to my spiritual path. I have the right to be secure in my person, my papers, my effects, my property. I have the right to feed and support my family. Um, and unless I am harming somebody else, unless I am infringing upon another's rights, then I am committing no crime. And unless you can prove that wrong, then you need to, you know, stop getting into our business. You need to stop, uh, you know, threatening us. You need to stop demanding money. You need to uh, show proof of claim uh, for your demands. You can't just demand money because you're some organization. And the city of Arlington is not a government. It's a corporation. So, I mean, there's, there's many things going on. So we address, you know, this stuff and according to due process of law, um, they don't even respond. They don't even acknowledge, which means that they've already established a dishonor. Uh, because the way law works is that if you receive a lawful notification, we sent it certified mail, um, 
you know, if you receive a lawful notification, because um, we put in there that if you do not respond within 30 days, uh, silences your, your acquiescence, you know, we're establishing a whole contract as we do this. It's, it's a very long process. But, um, you know, we do this all according to due process of law. They don't respond. So what happens is now they've established um, agreement based on their silence as acquiescence um, that we are right, which is that we have the right to pursue our happiness. We have the right to our spiritual path. We have the right to feed our family. We have the right to be secure. Um, so they agreed to all of that. But instead of taking actions which are in alignment with that agreement that they made according to due process of law, they still continue to threaten us. So they're sending us these citations saying, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then we respond again and say, uh, well, we sent you a lawful notification. You agreed that we're doing nothing wrong. You agreed that we're living within our, our rights, um, but you're still threatening us. So, you know, what's going on there? Of course, they, they still never respond. They don't ever respond. They don't ever respond. All they do is just, is just keep threatening and keep threatening without any standing whatsoever. They don't show any laws. They don't, you know, know nothing. Um, so finally, they're, they're literally threatening to come onto our land and abate the property. Uh, so we lock the gate. We put a, you know, we put a, a chain on there with a, you know, a, a padlock on there. Um, you know, we send them another lawful notification and say, look, um, this is our land. You are not welcome on our land. You have not showed any laws whatsoever that says we're doing anything wrong. You have agreed multiple times, um, according to due process of law, that we're living within our, within our rights. Um, you're threatening us. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you continue on this path in a dishonorable way, we are going to have to bring a lawsuit against you for you know, numerous things. Um, we contact the sheriff. Um, you know, we, we send him a, a correspondence of all the interactions that we've had with the city of Arlington. And we say, hey, look, we feel, we feel threatened. We feel like our livelihood is in danger. We've got um, unidentified individuals threatening to come onto our land um, and, you know, destroy our crops to abate our sustainable lifestyle. They haven't showed any standing in law whatsoever. Um, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, our life is in danger. We need your help as an elected official to protect the people. Um, we need you at a minimum to investigate this and contact us individually and let us know that there is nothing to worry about and that we are safe. Otherwise, we need you to enforce um, safety you know, for us, because yeah. that's your job. He didn't respond to us either. He didn't write back. He didn't call back. We gave him a phone number and everything. Pathetic. I mean, just really, really pathetic, really ridiculous, really sad. Um, you know, so anyways, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that winds up going on in this time. Uh, you know, the city of Arlington sends undercover cops. Uh, they send undercover cops to our, to our place. They fly helicopters over. They sent an unmanned drone. Um, they deny uh, that they sent an unmanned drone, but we know for a fact that they have an unmanned drone. And I have actually talked to multiple people that work in the city of Arlington that have told me they know for a fact that they sent an unmanned drone here. Wow. Okay. Um, so they're lying about all sorts of stuff. Um, they're sending undercover cops. They're spending taxpayer dollars. Um, they're doing all this research. They're sending helicopters over, right? And then on August 2nd, uh, 2013, uh, at, you know, the beginning of the morning, a fully battle ready, you know, black ops SWAT team breaks through the gate. They've got the whole, they've got this whole like neighborhood secured down. They've got police officers and all the neighbors pieces of land. They've got all the roads blocked off. They've got helicopters flying over. They've got like the huge, you know, vehicles that like bring in like these, you know, black op, you know, SWAT team guys. Yeah. Um, they come in, they just, they, you know, I mean, there's 20, at least 20 of these guys in full, you know, bulletproof gear. They got the bulletproof shields. They got sidearms. They got tasers. They got fully loaded assault rifles. They got goggles, face masks, helmets, uh, the full regalia, no identification whatsoever. Uh, and they come blasting in here and they're, they literally are coming in here like we're in Afghanistan and we're some terrorists like they literally are coming in here like get on the ground right now with their fingers on the trigger it? it was like 7 a.m 
um, you know, right in the, you know, beginning of the morning. Yeah. Um, you know, they come blasting in here, treating us like terrorists. And they, you know, put everyone in handcuffs. They, you know, put everyone in a room. You know, they're, you know, interrogating people, trying to get information. Uh, they keep us in handcuffs for two hours. Uh, they uh, take uh, nursing children from their mother. Uh, one of the children at the time was uh, two weeks old, born here in the Garden of Eden. Never been away from her mother. Um, you know, sleeps with her mother, nurses. Uh, you know, her mother doesn't have a job. You know, I don't have a job, so I mean, we're together every single day, all day long. A very, you know, intimate relationship. Uh, this SWAT team comes comes blasting in. They take the mother from her nursing children. Um, she literally has to ask permission in handcuffs to nurse her own children. Um, so, I mean, not only does that happen, but they don't find anything whatsoever that has to do with their warrant. Because, you know, how do you get a warrant for bringing in a, a huge SWAT team like that. You know, you've got to have something pretty substantial. Yeah. They don't show a warrant when they get here. We demand the warrant immediately. Like, as soon as they get here, that's the first thing I ask for. You know, I'm in handcuffs, of course, but I'm saying, where's the warrant? I'm not going to talk to you until I see a warrant. You haven't identified yourself. I need a badge number. I need a name. I need an oath of office. I need a warrant. Nothing, 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 nothing. They won't give anything. They won't answer any questions whatsoever. They're just, you know, uh, interrogating me like I'm a criminal, like I'm guilty, yeah. like I'm some dangerous, horrible person. So I don't answer any of their questions. Um, they finally do produce a warrant. Um, to, uh, after, you know, two hours after they arrest me for some supposed unpaid traffic ticket, which I got dismissed after the fact. Um, so they come in here. They're treating us like uh, you know these criminals. Their warrant, when I actually do get to read it, it's all for drug trafficking. So in this warrant, they say that we're heavily armed. We don't own a single gun, not a single gun, not even for defense, uh, not even for hunting, not a single gun whatsoever. And that's not because I disagree with guns. Um, I actually feel like the Second Amendment uh, rights are one of the most important rights. It's a, it's a foundation because without the guns in the people's hands, then you've got the guns in the government's hands, which as we know is not really a government to serve the people. It's a government to you know take advantage of the people. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this huge problem. And I mean, you can see all countries, um, you know, the, the, gun, the taking away of the guns is one of the last steps to a dictatorship. Yep. So, I mean, if you do history, you know, research, you can find these trends. History repeats itself over and over and over again. Obviously, this country is making a huge push to regulate and or control guns completely, mm -hmm. which shows you the direction that it's really going in. Um, so I'm, t I'm a huge fan of Second Amendment rights, but I don't need any guns. Um, I have no use for them. Uh, I don't believe in violence as a, even, you know, really ideally a form of self-defense. Um, in this situation, it wound up being a lot better uh, because, again, in their warrant, they said that we were heavily armed, that we were extremely dangerous. They said that we were a drug trafficking operation, that we were growing marijuana, that we had packaging operation, processing operation, that we'd have stacks of cash, that we'd have videos and photos of the operation, you know, all this stuff. They didn't find a single thing in their warrant. Not a single thing. And they didn't bring a single charge whatsoever involving any sort of drug, not even trafficking, but even like no drug paraphernalia, no nothing, no charges whatsoever. Uh, and yet, they happen to bring in their code abatement force, which is like another 50-man crew. Wow. They come in with lawnmowers, tractors, weed whackers, trucks, trailers, they cut down our blackberries, they cut down our okra, they cut down our tomatillos, they cut down our lamb's quarter, they cut down our sweet potatoes. Um, they just start cutting down crops, like, because it's long grass, right? Um, they they steal thousands, I think it was 20 tons, uh, or, I don't know, 20,000 pounds, some ridiculous amount. Uh, I've got it you know, on their, you know, little list sheet, I've forgotten by now, but, you know, many thousands of tons of sustainable materials. They stole 55 gallon barrels, wow. um, pallets, all sorts of stuff that if, if you do a tour around here, you will see we're using them constantly for all sorts of things. Um, so they cut down our crops, they steal our, our sustainable materials, and then they just leave. Um, so again, they come in here with this warrant, which is wrong in every single way. And not only is that a huge problem, but that's after they spend $50,000 for a helicopter. Right, $50,000 of the taxpayer's money to send a helicopter over this piece of land 
with high-tech equipment with a highly trained individual to look for what they said was here but it wasn't even here lambs quarters well they said marijuana was here <laughs> they said marijuana was here but it wasn't um, in fact um, they had this location where they were you know where they were sure marijuana was being located so the, you know the, the 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 force comes in here and they immediately go to that place and when they get there the first guy that gets there says oh fuck these are tomato plants wow yeah um, so they spend all this money, they use an unmanned drone, they send undercover cops, all of that, and they're still wrong. And they're still wrong. So what this, what this, what this, to, to me the question that this begs is either one, they're just completely and totally inept, completely and totally incapable, or two, they had a different agenda. Their agenda wasn't to find drug trafficking, that's just the excuse that they used in order to bust down the gate. Because they couldn't bust down the gate. They couldn't come in here with a SWAT team because of long grass. You see? Yeah. So, either way, it's a problem. Either way, it's a problem. Either one, they're completely and totally inept, and they're using $250,000 of taxpayer money for nothing, right? Um, it's actually worse than nothing because we're not just lazy people doing nothing, right? We're actually highly motivated, highly intelligent, highly responsible individuals that are feeding 40,000 free meals a year. And we're doing that with less impact on the earth than basically anybody else in the, well, I guarantee you than anybody else in the Metroplex, even homeless people. Our impact on the earth is way less than a homeless man because that homeless man spends more money on food in a week than I spend in 15 years. That's <laughs> zero. <laughs> right. I've spent zero <laughs> money on food in the last 12 years. You know, so he spends more money in a week, a homeless man, on food than I spend in 12 years. That's pretty crazy. Now, I do think that government is inept and you know it's it just keeps showing and showing and uh one of uh, my friends uh jeffrey tucker he, he's one of my heroes he's even pointing out in like the movie um mission impossible 3 how everything goes wrong in their you know operation like government always fails it's this big ugly stupid machine that doesn't work right so on that it's i mean these guys have like too much power i mean little power is too much for a government but just that shows this like how they are able to interrupt your life and you're not doing anything you're actually i mean you work hard to be able to do all this stuff is hard work yeah it is and then they come and they mow your plants and that's food that's you know what you guys eat what you guys used to feed people so did you use any kind of uh, lawsuit against them well my immediate number one response was the media um, because again I mean the system is much bigger than just uh, you know law enforcement yeah it's many layers and they've been perfecting this system to control people for a really long time yeah and actually the judicial system is one of the huge major players one of the huge major problems sure and they've actually set up the judicial system so that number one all municipalities have immunities mm. so basically what it means is is that anybody that's working for a municipality has full unlimited um, immunity as long as they're doing what their job description is or what they're told by their superior yeah so what that means is is that there's no accountability whatsoever for any of these swap people that run in here mm -mm. Um, so that's a huge problem number two it requires a vast amount of time and therefore money in order to bring a lawsuit against the city yeah huge huge vast amounts of time and therefore money um, and skill as well and skill so it's not easy to bring a lawsuit against a city it's almost impossible it, it very rarely happens and it very rarely succeeds yeah. and yet cities are are behind and responsible for atrocities every single day yeah i mean you look at all the fracking that's going on you look at all the people that are being displaced from their homes you look at all the swat raids i mean unfortunately we're not the only people that have been wrongfully raided by a swat team um you know so again my point is is that the the whole system is designed to have this control and every step of the way you know when the when the SWAT team came in here let's just say I did have guns okay let's say that they are wrong okay they're wrong which means that I have the right to shoot them what winds up happening from that I die that's what winds up happening yeah because even if I was able to take out 20 fully black ops battle ready SWAT guys 20 more come mm-hmm 
and then 50 more come, and then 100 more come, and even if I take out 100 guys, then they bring in a tank, and then they bring in a plane. You know, they're going to just bring in bigger and bigger weapons. So that's not a solution. It doesn't work. Um, so I can't defend myself against the law enforcement. Um, but then the next level is, you know, uh, remedy. We have the right to address grievances, but they've made that almost impossible to do. They've made that very difficult to do. They've made all these loopholes and all these processes that take months, if not years, to complete and thousands and thousands of dollars. So my first initial reaction was media because that's instantaneous. And um, really, I was, I, was, I was actually still very scared that it wasn't over. Oh. That it wasn't over. You know, that... Um, you know, this was only the beginning of something. Uh, so I immediately went to media because my intuition told me that if people are aware of what's really happening here, uh, they can't actually do what they're doing because everyone's going to see how wrong this is. Um, the truth really is, is self-evident, and this was a very good example of that because, you know, this story did go viral. It went viral. And it was not just nationwide, but it was worldwide. We had people from all the continents contacting us and saying, you know, we heard about this story, we support you, you know, you're an inspiration, you know, don't get, you know, don't give up, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we need more people like you, you know, thousands and thousands of people from around the world, you know, yeah. sending us emails like that. I was on the Alex Jones show, the Ron Paul show, um, you know, Huffington Post, um, you know, uh, not Fox, but NBC, ABC, uh, you know, those types of things. So, you know, it was a pretty big story, and it really did work. Because ever since that story went viral, like, they've tried to stay as far away from us as they possibly could. Um, we did explore doing lawsuits for a long period of time. We explored doing it pro se. Um, because really that's the ideal way to do it because you're not subject to as many of the loopholes and the restrictions that you would be if you had an attorney. Um, I don't know if you know this and probably a lot of people don't know this that are maybe tuning in here, but what makes an attorney an attorney? The bar card, right? Well, what is the bar card? What is the bar? All it is is a, an, a private association. That's all it is. It has no real standing in uh, constitutional republic law whatsoever. It has nothing to do with what our country was founded upon. It has nothing to do with um, we the people. It is a private association. And the bar stands for British Accreditation Registry, right? Which means that it's associated with Great Britain. Um, which really means that all it is is, you know, law of the sea. It's law of commerce. And these attorneys are subject to the rules of that private association, which have nothing to do with the Constitution. They have nothing to do with, um, you know, common law. They have nothing to do with, uh, you know, our amendment rights. Um, this is a, these are private rules by a private association. These attorneys have to pay their dues. They have to pay private dues. So they have to follow the rules and they have to pay the dues if they want to keep their bar card, mm -hmm. if they want to stay in the association. This is a huge problem. Um, you know, of course, most uh, judges are attorneys, or at least were attorneys. Um, almost all judges have stock in their courthouse. So it's in their own vested interest, um, you know, to have certain outcomes, not, you know, beyond justice, but monetary outcomes. Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, just really ridiculous stuff going on there. Um, also, it's extremely expensive. You know, every time you file papers, you've got to, you know, pay filing fees. Every time you, uh, you know, file those papers, you've got to, you know, send certified mail copies to all sorts of many parties. You've got to get all those copies. You, if you're doing it pro se, you've got to spend hours and hours typing up all this legal, you know, stuff that if you don't do it properly, it gets thrown out. And then you've got these judges and these attorneys which are working on the same side, which are looking for any opportunity to throw stuff out. I mean, it's extremely difficult. They've made it extremely difficult, unlike it used to be. It used to be super simple. It used to be extremely simple. That's why they called it common law, because it was law for the common man. You'd go and, you know, due process of law would, would, would unfold. And the judges, the judges' only purpose was to mediate and to make sure that each party had access to due process of law, that due process of law was unfolding so that the jury of our peers could make a decision yeah. based on the facts. And now it's completely and totally different. If you don't do it exactly the way the attorney or the judge says so, the judge is like, you must throw all that information out. Oh, that's stricken from the record. Um, oh, you know, that motion is dismissed because you didn't say those three words properly. I mean, it's just ridiculous, ridiculous. So 
we tried to do the whole pro se thing it really didn't work um, finally though we did get a, a really capable high-level attorney that is agreeing to do this on contingency which really is the way it should work anyways because now they have a vested interest in winning because that's the only way they get paid mm -hmm. so um, we don't have it uh, technically filed yet but it is in process uh, it is a it is a big deal and we do plan on winning uh, he's very capable and he wouldn't take the case if he wasn't 99% sure he was going to win because mm -hmm. he's investing tens of thousands of dollars of his own time um, and you know his all his people uh, and I mean it's a huge investment for him so yeah. uh, it, it, it'll, it will take a long time it's going to be a long drawn out case but it's going to be it's going to be powerful and I, I personally don't feel that we need to win in order to make the example that we've already made but I do feel like it will make even a more powerful example for us to win because number one it's going to say we don't have to be slaves we don't have to be subjects we can stand up um, and we can stand up even in the face of the vast hopelessness yeah. the impossibleness uh, of just you know the, the I mean the beast is so big it's so powerful it's so strong it feels like there's really nothing we can do True. but we can yeah we can we can so you know it's it's really it's really powerful it's really important and then of course you know the garden of eden you know we just are a very uh, a powerful living breathing example of a new paradigm uh, of a way of life that really it is superior in every single way again you know you look at what is most important to humans on this earth and almost every human is going to say the same thing and there's been actually lots of tests done by doctors and psychologists where they talk to people on their deathbed or that have cancer um, or that are you know old or whatever and they ask them these certain set of questions and almost everybody says the exact same thing um, you know and so the basic question is is what do you wish you did more of what do you did you wish you did less of and basically every single person says the exact same thing and that is I wish I spent more time with my family yes I wish I worked less mm -hmm. I wish uh, I spent more time doing the things that I love. I wish I spent less time doing the things uh, just for money. And that's basically what every single person says. Yet, almost every single person in the United States is living the exact opposite way. Right? So, we need to learn something. We need to, we need to you know, realize something that we have not realized if we want our lives to change. So, that's part of what we're doing here is we're showing people that we have way more than enough food every single day. We get to eat as much as we want, whenever we want, of whatever kinds of food we want. We don't have to have any diets. We don't have to you know, buy cheap food because we don't have enough money or have not enough food because we don't have enough money. We don't even have to get in the store and sit in traffic and you know, blah, blah, blah to get our food. Um, so we have as much food as we want. We get to eat whenever we want. We eat together. Um, none of us have jobs. We don't have to sit in traffic. We don't have to put on a uniform. We don't have to be around people that we politely tolerate. We don't have to do things that we're told, even though we disagree with them. But we have to do them anyways if we want to get our paycheck. And the real truth is, is that almost everybody, I know a lot of people that say they like their job. Um, and that's fine. You can say whatever you want. But the only real question is, is if you didn't get paid, would you still be doing it? That's, that's the litmus test. I love that question. Yep. And 99% of the time, the answer is no. Which means that you don't really love your job. You're just telling yourself that because it's easier to live telling yourself you love your job and it's easier to live telling people that you love your job than it is to admit the truth, which is that you're only doing it for money. Yep. Um, which there's nothing wrong with it, but the point of the matter, what you're trying to say is that, you know, at the moment of death, what's really important is what comes out. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I have no judgment whatsoever for anybody for having money have as much money as you want that's great that's fantastic but your life is going to be the result of your actions and what I can simply tell you is that these studies have been done um, this is this is it's, it's a timeless uh, worldwide phenomenon that that's happening which is that really all most of us want is to be happy yep and really what is happiness happiness is the freedom to express ourselves honestly mm -hmm. to uh, be involved in the things that we actually enjoy, that are actually interesting, that are actually inspiring and exciting, to be around people that we actually like, that we actually love, that we actually care about, and that actually care about us, and that actually like us, and that actually love us. Because most people don't. They really don't care about you. They really don't like you. Um, and they definitely don't love you. Um, 
you know, being able to be rested. Like to me, actually, one of the most profound things is being able to wake up whenever I want to. Uh, I just, I, I won't ever trade that back. There's just no way. I will live homeless on the streets for the rest of my life if I have to in order to sleep until I'm fully rested and to wake up without an alarm, to wake up not because I have to, but because I'm fully rested and I want to wake up. I've gone for, you know, 13 years now waking up basically every single day of my life not because I have to, but because I want to, yeah. because I'm fully rested. And it's just so much more enjoyable to be alive when you're fully rested, man. Yes. Oh, my God. It's just, it's not cool to to not get enough sleep. And most people, actually, they get so used to it that they can't even sleep fully anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't even know how to sleep for nine hours. They don't even know how to sleep without waking up. They don't even know how to sleep in. Because they've been doing it for so long, they can't even do it anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's profound. My family, I know a lot of people, unfortunately, are looking for every opportunity to, you know, get their children in school or to get them in daycare or to get them in an activity, you know, to get away from them so they have their own time. But for myself, the best, one of the best parts of my day is being with my children. I know it. Me too. Oh, God, it's so beautiful, man. It it's so enjoyable. I get to see every evolutionary stage of their life. I get to see the way they use their mouth, um, you know, to start making sounds. I get to see the way they use their hands to interact with their world, you know, from being able to sit up to being able to crawl to being able to walk. Um, I mean, just their love for life, their passion and their inspiration. I mean, they really are an example of the way we really want to be living uh -huh. as adults yeah. and are nowhere close to doing. Um, no insecurity, no inhibition. They're not scared of the way their bodies look. They're not, um, they're not trying to act appropriate or nice or considerate. They're just being authentic, who they really are. Uh, so I love being with my children. And I just cannot imagine getting up every day, or even five days a week, or even four days a week, or even two days a week, and saying, I have to leave you for your own good. Because that's what all parents say. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for your own good. But I don't want you to do it. Well, you don't know that you don't want me to do it. But you do. I'm doing it for your own good. No, Daddy. All I, all I want to do is play with you. Nope. I got to work for you. It's just, I mean, it's ridiculous, man. It really, really is. At least be honest and say, I don't like you because you're annoying. Um, I'd much rather be, you know, hanging out with the dudes at work. I'd much rather be, you know, saying cuss words and talking about bitches. You know, I'd much rather be playing pool or doing whatever. You know, you're a little kid. I don't like kids. At least be honest with them, man. Stop telling them that you're doing it for them because you're not. And I can tell you, man, I have not bought a single toy for any of my children. Not a single one. Because they don't need them. They don't. They don't fucking care at all. What they care about is being free. Even what? when you buy them t toys, they end up playing with the boxes. Yeah, I know. Um, the pl a plastic bag, man, was the favorite toy of both of my children when they were, you know, around three to six months. Yeah. Like a plastic bag was their favorite toy. The That's why the government came. <laughs> You're giving them plastic bags. I mean, plastic bags are just free everywhere. A you know, spoon, a stick. I mean, just everything is a toy to a child because yeah. it's new. And that's really what they care about is new things. It doesn't have to be something in a, in a, from a toy store. It just anything that's new that they can interact with. They love jars with lids. Yep. Anything that they can open and close. Anything they can put stuff inside of. Oh, man. I mean, Kiki, when she was two years old, she's three years old now. When she was two years old, she can come out to this garden. She could know which plants were weeds and which plants were edible. Wow. And she would literally pull the weeds, bang the dirt off, and throw the weed aside. Hmm. And she would come out for an hour and do that with me. No complaining. No complaining because it's not work. Because I didn't ever treat it like work. I didn't say, you have to come out with me and pull weeds. It's a, you're, you're, you're a child and you need to pull your weight. Never. I, went, I, I come out here and be like, hey, let's pull some weeds. And I do it with love. I do it with joy. I do it with excitement. She's like, I want to do it too. And so we'll come out here for an hour and we'll pull weeds. And while we're doing it, we'll eat our lunch. We'll eat it right from the ground. And she knows exactly what foods to eat. And she doesn't complain about it. Oh, I need some mayonnaise on here. I need the crust cut off. She's just like eating this live food right from the ground and loving it. Um, 
you know, there's just so many super profound and amazing things that are happening on a daily basis uh, because of the lifestyle we're living, which is just not even possible uh, when you're living a, a, a standard life. Um, you know, my children, um, you know, to, to the, to the dismay of many other people are allowed to be naked whenever they want to be naked. From my perspective, we're all born naked. Every single one of us is born naked. Most of us are all conceived in nudity as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so why and how can it be this horrible thing? You know, why and how can it be this horrible thing? Yeah. I don't see it. I see it as this beautiful thing. I see it as this pure thing. Um, and and it, it, it's, it's, to me, it's, you know, obviously my children, they have never shown any interest whatsoever in this, like, sexual perverted reality. Um, so it's definitely not that. Um, they also have this amazing ability to adapt. Like, in the wintertime, you know, Kiki, she'll be, like, running around naked, and it's, like, you know, because we don't use heating, so it's like 45 degrees inside. And she'll like be running around naked, and I'm wearing a fur hat. And I'm super adapted. Like, I'm really good at dealing with the temperature, but compared to her, I mean, she's regulating her own temperature without even clothes being on. Another cool thing that, you know, my five-year-old has never been institutionalized. Uh -huh. So, you know, like a little difference between, you know, your kids haven't either. Right. So how, how would you describe like the differences between our non-institutionalized kids versus peers from public school? Right. Well, I mean, there's so many differences. Really, everything is totally different. Um, it's really amazing. You know, when children come here, it doesn't matter what age they are, they don't want to leave. Uh, their parents have to, you know, drag them, drag them out of here because they just love being here because they can just feel this vibe of adventure, of exploration, of excitement, of freedom, of play. Um, so really everything is different. Every single thing is different. Most children, um, you know, go, uh, grow up in a crib. Uh, most children are born in a hospital. Uh, you know, from my perspective, again, I don't judge anybody and I don't think anyone should do what I tell them to do or do something because I do it. Uh, but I completely disagree with in every single way, you know, children being born in hospitals. I think that it's just as far from the truth, as far from natural, as far from healthy as you can pretty much get. Um, and so as soon as a child's born in a hospital, you know, it's this really unfortunate reality because what it means is, is that this ch child is being born to a disempowered mother. Because only a disempowered mother would give birth in a hospital. Yep. Only a disempowered mother would believe that she's not capable of doing something that's as natural as anything can possibly be. There is nothing more natural than giving birth. It's been done since the beginning of humanity. And before, um, every mammal that exists is giving birth uh, through their vagina. And it's been done since the beginning of time. And it's been successful. And no animal on earth goes to a hospital. And no animal on earth gets taught how to give birth. They just do it instinctively. They do it naturally. So women, human women also have that potential. They have the ability, but they've been institutionalized. They've been disempowered. They've been manipulated to fear nature yeah. instead of love nature. So they now believe that they're no longer capable. I'm not capable. This is going to be so scary. It's going to be so difficult. And now because they believe that, they have to go to a hospital to give birth because they're totally disempowered. Yes. So as soon as that happens, what that means is, is that even a mother who loves their children is a disempowered mother. And now what she's going to be doing is be providing a disempowered worldview for her children. Mm -hmm. So these children are going to grow up scared. They're going to grow up scared of not just birth, but all sorts of things. A woman that is scared of giving birth is scared of a lot of stuff, I guarantee you. Uh, she's scared of herself. She's scared of nature. Um, and this is super common. So again, I don't have judgment about this, and I know probably for any woman or even any man that have children born in hospitals, they're going to feel uncomfortable. This is not going to be something that's easy to hear, and I sympathize with that. You know, I, 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 I'm not, I, I don't want people to feel bad. But the truth sets us free, and the truth is often dark. And if we can't face the dark truth, we can't be free. And we'll just go on living, 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 living these, you know, broken slave lives. So hospitals are really a huge, huge, huge problem. Uh, immunizations are a huge, 
huge problem. Um, you know, Kiki and Noki, they really don't get sick. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a father, so my number one priority is my children's well-being. Um, and so if anyone thinks at any point in time that I ever do anything or allow anything to happen that is not in my children's well-being, uh, it's a misunderstanding. Just because you don't do that doesn't mean that it's not actually healthy. Yeah. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, you know, so for example, allowing my children to be naked when it's cold out, uh, I trust that they know when they're cold and when they're not cold. And they've proven that to be true 100% of the time. They've proven that to be true 100% of the time, and my children do not get sick. Um, they have been sick before, but compared to most children, it's they, not the same. Yeah, they might do. haven't been vaccinated either, and we are pretty. Um, I mean, we do share a lot of perspectives with you. So right. our guys, they they don't get sick. You know, we and whenever they do, it lasts. Um, you know, what 25 percent longer? I mean, less than Listen, or right. half the time from like the other guys. So this is something that is really important. To, you know, like being outside, getting dirty, uh, touching and feeling, and that that's pretty important too for immunities. Oh, super important. Super, super important. Yeah. I mean, I let children eat dirt. Um, you know, I let them pick food up off the floor and eat it. You know, and I'm not like bleaching the floor every freaking day. You know, to me, sterilization is actually a huge problem. It's not a benefit. It's a huge problem. And if you look in American society, they're constantly washing their hands. They're constantly using bleach. They're constantly sterilizing. They got these hand sanitizers. And they're being told this story that it's in the name of health. But really, it's just in the name of business. They just want to sell you stuff. That's really what they want to do. Um, I've already proven that I'm healthier than pretty much anyone you've ever met. Um, I prove that every single day. I've also already proven that my children are much healthier than the average child. Um, if and and that's and that's that's what really matters. That's what really matters. Not this, you know, not this commercial that says germs are bad. That means nothing. No. What really matters is results. Right, results, living, breathing life. And so like I said, I'm, I'm a father and my number one priority as a father is making sure that my children are healthy, that they're happy, that they're being taken care of. I would not allow them to eat food off the ground if I uh, saw anything that led me to believe that it was not good for them. Um, I would not allow them to be naked when it was cold out if I saw anything that led me to believe that it was not good for them. Sure. And I am, I'm not just like watching TV all day and they're just like doing stuff and I don't know. Do you even own a TV? We have a TV, but it's not hooked up to any TV. You know, uh, it can play movies from time to time, like maybe once a month we watch a movie on there. Um, you know, sometimes we use it to like connect to the computer and, you know, do like, uh, you know, PowerPoint presentations and things like that. But... You know, we have a TV. I'm not opposed to TVs. Again, TVs aren't the problem. You know, it's our relationship with TVs that are the problem. I don't sit my children in front of TVs. I don't sit myself in front of TVs. Um, you know, and I am with my children every single day. Uh, not every single moment of every single day because I've got a lot of responsibilities and importances that I'm, that I'm a part of. But I am aware of what their life is like every single day, all day long. And I know when they're sick and when they're not sick. And I have seen that they do not get sick from eating dirt. Mm. They do not get sick from eating food off the floor. They do not get sick from being naked um, when it's cold out. And they do not get sick from being out in the sun without sunscreen. We don't use sunscreen. I don't either. We don't use any of those things. Their yeah. skin just gets dark and they just can take more and more and more and more. And these children very rarely get sick, if ever at all. And even when they do, it only lasts maybe a day. Um, they don't have runny noses. Most children, like in school, have runny noses constantly. Always. Um, you know, so there's a lot of factors that are going on. I mean, I could talk about this for an hours and hours and hours and hours, uh, but health is a, is a huge difference. Um, you know, the, the children's responsibility is a huge thing. Um, you know, Kiki, she's three years old now. She uh, folds her own clothes and puts them away in at the proper three. at three years old wow. in the proper drawer um, she goes pee in her own potty and empties it out into our bigger uh, decomposing toilet washes it all by herself um, she does her own dishes she knows how to sweep the floor if she makes a mess like if she eats a pizza pizza or you know a piece of bread or 
you know, a cookie or whatever and gets crumbs, she'll take the broom and sweep it into the dustpan and put it in the compost pile. She knows what food goes in the compost pile. She knows what food go or what trash goes in the trash. She knows what goes in the recycling. She knows what goes in, you know, all the different, you know, various receptacles that we have. She knows what food is edible and what not. She comes out here and harvests wild mushrooms. Um, you know, she... Uh, she can chop. She can chop food with like really sharp chef's knives. Wow! Um, I That's mean, just impressive. yeah, super super high level responsibility. Um, you know, and which is just really really unheard of for most children. And you know, again, I could talk about why that is for hours, but that's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, you know how much how much time you know they spend you know complaining or crying is a very small amount. You know, they do cry. They do get upset. You know, I'm not going to pretend like they don't. Um, but really, it's just because, you know, they get hurt or their feelings get hurt or there's a misunderstanding or they're tired. And then as soon as, you know, the real issue is addressed, there's no problem. And it's not like, you know, this repetitive, reoccurring, you know, thing. We don't have any, you know, we don't do any discipline, you know, because there's no need. There's no need for discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, super, just super, um, just thoughtful and caring. You know, they, they share everything. Um, the, the two sisters have a little bit of competition with each other. You know, Kiki, the older sister, likes to kind of take away stuff from her other sister. It's a little bit of a problem. Um, but I don't ever get mad at her. I don't ever punish her for it. I just talk to her about it. Um, and, and it's just, it's really amazing. It's really powerful to just see, you know, how much she can comprehend. I've really actually never talked to her about anything she can't really comprehend. That's great. Um, so that's really powerful. You know, their, you know, their capability, you know, is just really high level. All the things that, you know, they're capable of doing, you know, is really profound. They're, I mean, they're really gorgeous, really beautiful. You know, everyone that sees their photos is just like, oh my God, you know, these children are so beautiful. Um, people love being around them. They're just like this light, you know, that lights up, lights up any environment that they're in. Um, you know, they're not difficult, you know, and that's a huge thing is most people see parenting as very difficult. They see it as something that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of resources. Um, that hasn't been my experience. Um, to me, it's actually gives me energy. Um, it doesn't take away energy from me. It really gives me energy. I feel um, like I'm doing something I really want to do with my time versus doing something I have to do. Uh, and you can see, like, that is pretty legit. You're... you're um body language changes your voice changes yeah. so I, I can sense that that's pretty legit you know like from the stories that we were telling to now right. you've changed your energy changed so yeah I, I agree with all that you've said and it's pretty evident I can see it on on you and I mean I, I've seen your kids so I can attest to that um, I'm really grateful for uh, opening your doors to this interview and um, you have a Facebook page Garden of Eden correct um, you're on Facebook too on your personal page so if you guys are interested just uh, we're gonna post also the Facebook page his personal one and the Garden of Eden if you're ever here on a Sunday they have an open house so just drop by say hi and uh, he's pretty awesome they there's a bunch of people here they're all really um, friendly so again this is Luis with emancipated human and anything else you would like to tell us before we um, call it a day yeah I would um, and really what I would just really like to conclude with and really like to say is that nature is based on abundance there really is way more than enough of everything and we have just been institutionalized in this story of lack yes there really is way more than enough of everything and the fact I love facts I don't like opinion I don't like speculation I don't like that stuff I like facts and this is a fact you can check the budget of the United States military just the United States military is enough to feed every single person on earth for a whole year so one annual budget for the military is enough to feed every person on earth so what that means is if we were just to take the resources that we have or which are being used to kill people to control people to steal resources if we were just to take that money and use that to feed people, we would already have not a single hungry person on the entire earth. And no war. Well, at least at least not with this one country, which is a you know a huge proponent of most of the wars on earth. Yeah. Um, so that's that's my point right there to prove abundance. Mm -hmm. That's just with that one change. Now, if you uh, 
you know actually start living sustainably and start using sustainable techniques i mean it just produce it, it, it improves exponentially so there is way more than enough of everything it is possible to be healthy you know a lot of people like they've got allergies i mean which really is just a totally ridiculous thing like it's not natural um, a lot of people are overweight you know a lot of people don't have a lot of energy and that's become normal but it's not natural and it doesn't have to be that way and you don't need a lot of money you don't need surgery you don't need pharmaceuticals to get healthy like just by living a simple holistic healthy life you will be healthy um, so my main point is is that actually the potential for life is really great it's really exciting it's really fun and it doesn't have to be this boring drudgerous stressful uh, you know lacking reality it really can be fun it can be exciting it can be abundant it can be beautiful it can be healthy um, and you know living in sustainable community even if you don't live on the same piece of land like we do you know sharing all of our resources and whatnot sustainable community really is the way of the future uh, because the more we come together for common purpose the easier life gets uh, the more we succeed the more uh, easier it is the more abundant it is we have to start coming together for common purpose. In this country especially, we're super uh, compartmentalized, super individualistic. We all have our own lawnmower. We all have our own, you know, everything. And we only use it, you know, a few times a year. Um, there's just so many ways that we could help each other so much more. Not with everything, but things that we truly agree on. Things that we have common purpose in. Help each other with that. Um, and life just gets so much easier and so much more abundant. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Indeed. So, see you guys uh, next time. Thank you for tuning in. Be well. Peace, love, and anarchy. Quick test making sure that this is recording properly right. um how well, do you like the weather epic interview of course not M matter of fact i'm just gonna do telly so we don't have to be moving it so pretty cool weather yeah it's for us in the middle of august it's very cool i mean global warming at its best <laughs> yeah i mean that's a that's a complicated subject you know really again which you know people talk about but really, almost no one has any real factual knowledge, any real experience. They're just talking about stuff that they've been told. You know, they're just regurgitating information. And you'll find this with almost every subject in any conversation you talk with about anybody. They're just regurgitating information that they saw on TV, that they read in a book, um, or whatever. And some people, you know, are more intelligent than others. Some, you know, are better at research than others. But pretty much everybody is just regurgitating information. Mm -hmm. There's very few people that have actually spent the time uh, necessary to have real experience um, on the issues that they're actually discussing. Yeah. And without that, you know, really it's just masturbation. And I, I think that part of that is it's not linear. It has so many things are connected to that. Right. that you know like yeah maybe right that this part that you're talking about yeah sure but have you connected that to this other thing yep. so it's just like the lack of awareness i think you know so then you're just like really strong about something but but, but this i mean another thing that was pretty important was the the shift of the magnetic pole you know so the, the, even the pilots had to rearrange their compasses and the airplanes because they were getting lost right. so i mean that it, some places are getting cooler some places are getting warmer but that's also because of, it's shifting so it's not i mean it's not really human made for what i've learned right i would agree so i would totally agree with that and i you know it's a really fascinating subject um you know one i would i would love to talk about um you know but even if it's not human made it definitely doesn't discount you know the fact that humans are living extremely unsustainably that is the point right. and i'm not saying no to that I, I think that there's a lot that we can do for that mm -hmm. but you know like i think it was like the, the latest numbers i said was like six percent was what humans were contributing to the global warming so like six percent right. is really nothing to be stressed about let me check it see yeah, if this works
Ready? Are you okay with the sun? Yeah. So welcome once more to another episode of Emancipated Human. My name is Luis and today I have a, a pretty cool guest. His name is Ecker. Oh, fuck. I forget your last name. Quinn Aker. Aker. Like land? Yeah. It's spelled E-A-K-E-R, so it sounds like Eker, but yeah, it's that's pronounced Aker. Okay. Aker. <laughs> Aker. <laughs> 